Hi, everyone. Welcome back. This lesson is on differential reinforcement. Now, there's a lot of different types of differential reinforcement, and I split it into three different lessons so we can talk about each type. This specific lesson will cover the main types that you will use the most, but other lessons will cover types that you might use less in practice. But what is it? It's a reinforcement strategy. So you reinforce specific behaviors while withholding reinforcement from for others. You don't necessarily have to withhold as part of differential reinforcement, but it is more effective with extinction, which would be withholding reinforcement for certain behaviors. What this does is it will strengthen alternative, incompatible, or other behaviors. It will show and communicate to the person that if you engage in these positive behaviors, you're going to get what you want. And then if you engage in these behaviors we don't want to see, you're not going to get what you want. And so this is the reason I call this a teaching strategy. You're building the strength of these behaviors. So you're not only teaching them new behaviors, but you're building new behaviors. We're going to talk about these three main types. It's very important that you can differentiate between the three main types. So if someone gives you an example, you can say that's this type or that's that type. That's a lot of the content on any kind of test you might be taking. Um, it's also important that you understand it for practice so that you're able to utilize these successfully. And you also know like this is the DRA for this. This is a DRI for this. So the first one we're going to learn and the most useful of all of them is differential reinforcement of alternative behavior. To do this successfully, you need to know what the function is. Once you know the function of your problem behavior, you're going to pick another behavior that serves the same function that you do want to see. So you're going to reinforce a more appropriate alternative to the behavior, but it must serve the same function. It doesn't have to look similar. So if a child screams to get attention, a possible replacement behavior would be reinforcing raising a hand or saying, excuse me, just something appropriate that will gain that child attention. The alternative behavior will serve the same function of getting attention. This is a strategy that reinforces an appropriate alternative behavior to reduce a problem behavior. So here's some examples of our alternative behaviors. One is when somebody screams for attention, they can ask for help. When frustrated, a student can use a help card or say, I need help. Provide immediate assistance when the alternative is used hitting. So if someone's hitting, you could reinforce asking for a break. So if they're hitting because they're overwhelmed and they don't want to do the task, which would be escape behavior, you would reinforce asking for a break. So they can say break please instead of hitting staff. Grabbing items so they clearly want those items. That would be the function of that. <clears throat> so requesting with words or pecs. Instead of grabbing snacks off the table, the student can use words or pecs to request the snack. Give the snack when the student requests for it appropriate. And again, when they engage in these replacement behaviors, you do have to immediately give them whatever the function is. So we're going to immediately reinforce it. If a student runs away to escape something, staying with the group. During recess, the student should stay in the designated area instead of eloping. Praise tokens or access to preferred activities can be used to reinforce staying close. If running away is serving attention, staying with the group would also be serving attention. But if this was escape behavior, then you might be requesting a break from the group. It depends on what the function is. So interrupting would be most likely serving the function of attention. And so the alternative behavior would be raising hand and still getting that attention. So, and you would call on them and provide praise. With all replacement behaviors, we provide the natural reinforcement, whatever the function is. And we also provide extra reinforcement. So praise, 
something else that they want. And the reason for that is because you have to make this new behavior more desirable than the problem behavior. They have to gain more for this new behavior than they would for the problem behavior. So they should gain what they gain for the problem behavior plus more. This is differentially reinforcing incompatible behavior. So DRI, this is reinforcing something that is physically incompatible with the problem behavior. So it is impossible to do the problem behavior and this behavior at the same time. The function doesn't matter. It's an alternative. The alternative behavior and the problem behavior cannot occur at the same time based on the topography, based on what they look like. A behavior that serves the same function is ideal, a DRA, but sometimes we can't figure that out or there's not something that works. So we might use a DRI instead. You would identify a behavior that is physically impossible to do during the problem behavior, and then you would deliver reinforcement. You deliver whatever the function of the problem behavior is. This one doesn't access it automatically, like asking for attention when you're engaging in problem behavior but you'd also provide extra reinforcement on top of it. Okay, so for hitting, instead, if hitting was for attention and you were doing a DRI, DRA, you would make sure your replacement behavior was something that they could gain attention from. But if you were doing a DRI, you might do hands in pockets. It's impossible to hit with your hand in your pocket, and I say that, and I've seen kids actually do that. So these are never perfect, right? Learners can find a way to do their behavior despite their DRI sometimes. I did a lot of, I used to do high five for hitting. You would think that's physically incompatible. You can't high five and hit at the same time. These are never perfect, but it's kind of like a trial and error. You might try something for a while and see that's not working because they're actually engaging in problem behavior at the same time, you need to understand the definition and be able to come up with a couple of these. For a child who's standing on a chair, they would not be able to sit properly and stand on a chair all at the same time. I'll give you all my, I get creative with like, how could they do that? Well, you know, it, dep it totally depends on how you're going to define sitting properly, but someone could sit on the table part of the desk <laughs> and have their legs straight. If you make sure that your definition is in the seat part, it would be impossible to stand on the chair and sit properly. Talking out and staying silent during instruction. If they're always calling out, then you might reinforce staying silent during instruction. Talking out is probably for attention. They're not going to get attention if they stay silent. So we use these when we cannot use the DRI, DRA. Wandering around, sitting at desks. So wandering around the classroom, you might have them sit at the desk. I've seen kids who were reinforced for just staying in their desk move their whole body and the desk all over the room. Chewing on shirt, chewing on a chew, like a chew thing that is more appropriate. And so that would also be a DRI for that. So these you physically cannot do the problem behavior and your replacement behavior at the same time. Our last one in this section is DRO. So it's differential reinforcement of other behavior. What you're going to do is deliver the reinforcement when the problem behavior does not occur during a specific time. So I think of this, the other is anything anything but the problem behavior. So the reinforcement is delivered when the problem behavior does not occur. They are doing things and that's their other behavior. No specific alternative behavior is required. It's just anything. Reinforce every five minutes that no yelling occurred. So reinforce the absence of yelling. It's used to reduce problem behaviors and strengthen other behaviors. Focuses on increasing appropriate behaviors rather than directly targeting the problem behavior. So it's almost like allowing them to choose what other behavior they want to do because everyone behaves, everyone's engaged in stuff. So they're not yelling for those five minutes, but they're probably like maybe they're doing their work. Maybe they're talking quietly with their friend, doing a puzzle or something. So you're actually reinforcing that, whatever that other is, but you're letting them choose what that might be. Where this can become problematic is if you get another problem behavior during this that you haven't defined and you're not doing a DRO on. So that does happen. Let's say they're just yelling for attention. You tell them like, hey, you're going to get reinforcement if you don't yell for five minutes. 
most of the time, or not most of the time, a lot of the time, a child might choose something just as distracting and disruptive as yelling to get attention that way like making weird noises and then you have this other problem behavior so you have to know that will probably happen and work through that with DRO so these are all like no something for a certain amount of time so no tantrums for five minutes you'd reinforce no tantrums they can whine during those five minutes you have to understand lesser problem behaviors you're accepting in these scenarios they can ask for help in the five minutes they can do uh, anything during but just not tantrum no spitting during group time so if they don't spit you'd give them reinforcement no cursing on the playground so reinforce a sticker for every recess period without cursing so again they might come up with silly words that are just as just well they wouldn't be as distracting as cursing no aggression during task completion no property destruction in the 10 minute interval okay so these are three that you have to be pretty clear on and understanding a dra is differential reinforcement of alternative behavior a functional but appropriate alternative behavior DRI is differential reinforcement of incompatible behavior, a behavior that can physically not happen at the same time as your problem behavior. And then DRO is differential reinforcement of other behavior, any behavior except the problem one. So it's the absence of your problem behavior. So how do you choose the right procedure? You determine the replacement behavior. So it's DRA. If there's a safe, appropriate replacement behavior, you always want to choose DRA. They are the most powerful because not meeting those other ones, the DRI and DRO do not necessarily mean they're meeting their function. So meeting the function, like the person needs whatever that function is. They need it. A lot of times it's a neurological need, like needing a break, needing attention. We're not going to stop someone from needing those things. Instead of trying to eliminate the need, we give them a way to get their needs met, which is appropriate and the environment is more open to. So you always want to do a DRA if possible. To prevent the problem behavior, you might use a DRA if there's a behavior that prevents the problem behavior from happening. But if you do that, make sure they have a way to make to meet that need. And then when you want to eliminate the behavior completely, you might want to do DRO. Or if you can't figure out a DRA or DRI that works, you might do DRO so the person will choose their own replacement behaviors. Reduce but not eliminate the behavior. When you're using differential reinforcement effectively, you're going to consistently reinforce. You always reinforce. If they're getting satiated on their reinforcers, we'd move to a token economy. You'd always need to use powerful and meaningful reinforcers. Choose reinforcers that are highly motivating and valuable to the individual, not generic. Like, oh, everyone likes stickers. We'll do stickers. That's not going to work. Immediate reinforcement. Provide the reinforcement immediately after the desired behavior to strengthen the connection. Gradually fade the reinforcement. So you want to start with high frequency, so a CRF, FR1 schedule and fade into a new schedule. And data-driven adjustments. So you want to monitor it to make sure those replacement behaviors are continually increasing while problem behaviors are decreasing. And if that's not what's happening, you got to go back to the drawing board to reassess. Why these strategies work. This is positive reinforcement. So this is when we talk about different strategies for positive reinforcement. They both describe our world and help us create interventions. DRs are positive reinforcement. They're our main strategy utilizing positive reinforcement. We're teaching them a new strategy and showing them that the environment will back them up on that new behavior and give them what they need from that new behavior so that new behavior will be better than their problem behaviors these strategies are supported by research we've seen it work time and time again and they're also considered fairly ethical i still say if you can change the environment do that try that first but if you can't then you would move into these drs Common mistakes we make during differential reinforcement, we reinforce the problem behavior by accident, inadvertently providing attention or rewards to our unwanted behavior. A good example of this is just reprimand. <laughs> 
we think reprimand's a punishment, right? And so you reprimand every time the problem behavior occurs. Lots of teachers, lots of parents naturally do that. If the problem behavior is not going down with a reprimand, that might be actually reinforcing the behavior. Kids like attention. Everybody likes attention. And even though that's negative attention, like, no, don't do that, that might be better than nothing. So you might be reinforcing the problem behavior. You're doing all this DR stuff and working really hard with these replacement behaviors. But every time you see the problem behavior, you're reprimanding them. And so you're inadvertently reinforcing it. Choosing a replacement behavior that's too hard or unclear it has to be feasible, especially based on age. I see people choose complicated stuff for little guys, and it doesn't usually work. You want it to be really simple. Simple's always better. So using DRO without teaching what to do instead. Just because we use the DRO, we are still going to explain options that they can do instead, but they should have multiple options. So it's like, oh, we're not going to yell during our independent work period, but what can you do? Finish your work, but give them other stuff they can do during that independent period to keep them distracted from yelling or whatnot. Okay, so what is DR? It's strengthening alternative behaviors, reinforce specific behaviors that serve the same function as your problem behavior. We have physically incompatible behaviors are our Oh, sorry. D this is our DRA. So you're going to reinforce specific behaviors that serve the same function. Then the second one is our DRI. We're going to reinforce physically incompatible behaviors. So reinforce behaviors that cannot occur at the same time as the problem behavior. And then your DRO is reinforce a problem behavior that doesn't occur during a specific time period.